welcome to uh, to the Divine Worship Hour here at Pathway to Peace Ministries. We're glad that you continued with us, and uh, we're going to go ahead and begin with prayer. Dear most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for this holy, blessed, high Sabbath day that you have uh, given to us. We thank you, Lord. And we pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit to continue to teach us. And may, may we apply the truths that you give us to our lives and be saved. Thank you so much for your word that teaches us. And thank you for your opportunity to be saved. Bless us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing our Sabbath song, which is found in Exodus chapter 20. Verses 8 through 11. It's also the fourth commandment. Today is a commemoration of the day that God gave his commandments to his people. Exodus for the uh, Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment specifically. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son. Nor thy daughter, thy man servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that's within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven. Wherefore the Lord bless the Sabbath day and hallowed it. At this time, Elijah will come and lead us into our hymn of worship as well as prayer. The Lord's our rock, hymn 266. The Lord's our rock. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever may be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Mighty rock, in a weary land, cooling shade. All the burning sand, faithful guide for the pilgrim band, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes fright, a shelter in the time of storm. Mighty rock in a weary land, cool and shade on a burning sand. Faithful guide for the pilgrim band, a shelter in the time of storm. On the raging floods may round us be a shelter in the time of storm. We find in God a 
Mighty rock in a weary land, cooling shade, cooling shade on a burning set. We pull guide for the pilgrim band, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our help forever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Mighty rock in a weary land, cool in shade on a burning sand. Faithful guide for the pilgrim bed, a shelter in the time of storm. prayer for all those who have prayer requests um, that, um, and uh, all those who are being affected by the many things going on now on the earth, the violence, the crime, the um, pestilences and earthquakes, hurricanes and uh, wars. And so we're going to pray for the victims of those things. And, um, and, uh, also, thank the Lord for the many things He has done for us. So let's let's go in a little bit of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for this blessed Sabbath day you've given us. Um, also, pray for um, the uh, the world um, who has greatly um, who is re- greatly asleep at this time. Uh, please um, bless the, uh, the efforts to give the gospel to them. We also pray for those affected by the many things going on now, the, um, the press pestilences, earthquakes, uh, crime, violence, and, and the many other things. Um, and we also pray for uh, the prayer requests that um, some may have, and that many have. <laughs> and please um, bless the Sabbath uh, service as we continue to Today and please teach us the and reveal to us the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care. And bids me at my father's throne make all my wants and wishes known in seasons of distress and my soul has often found relief and often escaped the tempter's snare by thine return, sweet hour of prayer. So now we'll have the health talk by who? Nehemiah. Amen. Amen. I am going to be doing the health talk. 
Let's sing the new start song. Let's have a new start. 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 Let's have a new start. A new start. A new start to keep, to keep me strong. Hey, add food, have the right one every day. And nutrition, eating fruits, grains, nuts and veggies. Eating fruits, grains, nuts and veggies. E, exercise 30 minutes, five days. W, water, drinking eight cups a day. S, sunshine, 30 minutes, and vitamin D. T, temperance, say no to alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, and caffeine. Say no to alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, and caffeine. A, air, getting fresh every day. R, rest, eight hours a night. And T, Trust in God, trust in God. So let's have a new start. So go tell somebody today. Today we are talking about the benefits of broccoli. Broccoli. Broccoli is considered a superfood because it has a lot of health benefits. Broccoli helps for cancer. Broccoli makes you strong. Is it has C. Broccoli, broccoli, broccoli reduces inflammation in the body. It has a it has a lot of fiber, which the next one is going to be that that will help clean the heart. Broccoli is full of fiber, both soluble. And insoluble fiber. Um, the, the they both do basically the same thing, but one breaks down and was one doesn't. Of of the soluble and unsoluble, they but they both uh, clean out the heart and arteries and all of that. Eat bro. Uh, broccoli is considered a cruciferous vegetable, and uh, cruciferous vegetables are called that way because um, they have a cross when they when they grow and they uh, produce a flower to produce seed. The flower is a shape of a cross, and one of the reasons why it's called cruciferous that reminds us of the cross, but it also helps us remember the cleansing power of God to save us because that's what it. Uh, Jesus did by his death on the cross. Uh, And all cruciferous vegetables are good, including broccoli. So you want to eat lots of broccoli. Thank you. Um, We're going to go ahead and begin our Bible story with prayer. Dear most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, as we continue, we ask, Lord, that uh, you continue to teach us. We ask, Lord, that um, your Holy Spirit will be poured out and that your truth will continue to go forward with power. And prepare people to stand for you in the great day of judgment. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are in our uh, new topic that we started on last time. And uh, we were talking about God's character. And the reason we're talking about God's character is because we want to be prepared for when God comes, right? And in order to be prepared, the Bible says we have to have our father's name in our forehead. And his name is basically saying 
his character. So we have to have his character. We have to reflect his character. We have to be like him. So if we want to be saved, one of the things that we have to do from, is learn more about his character, right? So today's character that we're looking at, last time we looked at the character of mercy. Today we're looking at the character of just. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. And this is one of the characters of God. And Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 through 4. It's one of God's characters, and it should be one of our characters as well. So let's learn more about this character, how uh, it's what it is, and how people in the Bible have uh, shown this characteristic that we must also have. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 through 4. It says, Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrines shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will do what? I will publish the name of the Lord. Remember the father's name. This is his name. I'm going to publish it for you. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. Then that's what we were singing this morning already or this afternoon already. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. So what is, what is uh, the characteristics of God? His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, without iniquity, so there is no sin with him, just and right is he. So today we're looking primarily at the characteristic of being just. So what is just? What is just? Any ideas? What is just? When a person says a person is just, what does that mean? They're not guilty. That's right. That's right. Just means they're not guilty. Just. We we hear it a lot. What is just? It means righteous. It means right. I looked it up. The Hebrew and the Greek word for just. And they both both, uh, basically say the same thing. And it's kind of like what you said, Nehemiah. Yeah, the right, um, equity, uh, justice, righteousness, um, it's innocent or holy. And uh, that's the way that God's, God is. And so to understand this, we're just going to go through some of the texts that relate to it so we can see exactly what he's meaning by being just. Because sometimes to understand the word, you use examples to understand it, okay? So let's go to Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. And what we're doing now is going through examples in the Bible of people who have exhibited this characteristic as well. God is just. His law and commandments are just and true. And uh, let's see how some of the people in the Bible, how they were in... uh, how they exhibited this characteristic. Genesis chapter 6, we're going to start with verse 5. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. So when it says wickedness of man, obviously this is contrasting from just because this is, a, this is totally the opposite, right? It says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only what? Evil continually. And it repented the Lord made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will do what? Now, you know it had to get to the point where God said, I will destroy man whom what? I did. So we're God's creation. And here we see at a time when things got so wicked that God said he had to destroy the man that he had created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was what? Just. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah 
walk with God. So Noah's character was totally the opposite of the wicked of his generation, right? So here's an example of what just is. Was Noah doing the things that were wicked that were along with the other ones? No, because he would never have found grace in the sight of God if he was doing wickedly. The Bible makes it very clear that Noah was just. He was a just man. He had a just character. And again, that is the character of all who are saved. Who are some other examples of those who are just that the Bible actually mentions? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. There are many cases, but we're just going to go through a few of them just to get an idea of what this justice actually means. Because when you think of just people, if you understand how their character was, that lets you know how our character has to be. Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. And this is talking about another just person. It says, Then Joseph, her husband, the, that was the husband of Mary, being a what type of man was he? Just man. And not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away. How? Privately. That was the, when he was talking about uh, Mary. And, but Joseph was the father, who was the father, the earthly father, earthly parent of Jesus. He was considered a just man, and he was someone who was looking for the coming of the Messiah. And he was considered a just man as well. Let's turn to um, just a few more examples just to get the idea. Acts chapter 10, verse 22. Acts chapter 10, verse 22. Acts chapter 10, verse 22. Here's another example of a just man. Acts chapter 10, verse 22. It says, and they said, Cornelius the centurion, a what type of man was he? A just man. And one that did what? Feared God and of a good report. Jews was warned from God by an holy angel to his house and to hear words of thee. So here's a man who was just. In Acts chapter 10, it tells a man who feared God and Peter goes to Julius and his whole house were saved. A, he was a Gentile, a ruler over um, a number of soldiers, a man of, of um, reputation. And he was considered a just man before God because when he learned the truth, he, and first of all, he wanted to know the truth because some people, they don't want to know. He wanted to know the truth. God sent Peter to teach him even more of the truth. And as he learned the truth, he had, he continued to follow in the truth, he and his whole household. Let's see how God's people are to live. Romans chapter one, verse 17. How are we to live? How are the just to live? Romans chapter 1, verse 17. It says in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live how? By faith. The just shall live by faith. So we are, as God's people, to be just as well, Right? But the way that we are to receive justice or to get justice is we can't even get it ourselves. Justice is righteousness. And it's interesting that I, we can't have righteousness in and of ourselves. I cannot make myself just. It's a characteristic that we must have because we've got to reflect God's character. But it's a, a, a characteristic that I cannot make myself have. In fact, it's something that God takes responsibility for. In fact, uh, let's go to First um, Peter, chapter three, verses fifteen through eighteen. First Peter, chapter three, verses fifteen through eighteen. It says, "But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear." having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that they accuse your good conversation in Christ. 
For it is better if the so that ye suffer for being for doing well doing than for evil doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. It says in um, that he is not only the he is not only just, but he is the justifier of those who uh, come to him. Let's look at that text. Let's look there. It says in uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 26. Romans chapter 3. So continued uh, in Romans verse 23 through 26. This is what God takes responsibility for. Romans chapter 3, starting with verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare I believeth in Jesus, so it is God that makes us just. He is just, and he's the justifier of us. First John chapter 1, verse 9 puts it this way, and this is how he does it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and, what else? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So do we have any excuse? When God is just and he says, I'm going to justify you, he makes he is the justifier of us from all in righteousness. OK, so get the picture. Right. Justice is like a pair of balancing scales. And last week, too, we talked about mercy. And on one side of the scale, you have mercy where God forgives. And, he, and but on the other side of the scale, you have God's law which is a standard of righteousness that we all have to meet. And we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we need God to forgive us and to cleanse us so that we can be made just before the Father. But even with the, uh, even as God forgives us and cleanses us, he's got to balance it. He's got to balance it. He cannot just say, well, keep sinning, keep sinning, keep sinning, and nothing will happen to you. I will just continue to have mercy. Nor can he on the other side say, nor does he, because he could have. He said, this is the law. You've broken it and you're doomed to hell forever. God doesn't do, go to either of those extremes. He is just and the justifier, meaning that he has mercy on repentant sinners, that he forgives us. And he cleanses us so that we can be justified or stand just. Now, here's a story of an example of someone who was just. And you see how when you understand God's justice, you are considered a witness to show forth others and declare the God's justice and stand for justice. I mean, you cannot just let things go by and say, okay, well, you know, uh, whatever. When you see sin in churches in in the world in general you have to be someone of principle and justice and that's why it makes it personal when you understand god's character of justice we have to be just as well so today we're going to look at someone whose story is a story of a man who is just and um what he did as a result or what he said turn to me to mark chapter six mark chapter six Mark chapter 6, Matthew, Mark chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 17, and it's going to talk about this man who is a just man. Uh, Mark chapter 6, starting with verse 17, it says, For Herod, Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison. Why did he bind him in prison? For Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, what did John tell Herod? It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Philip was the son of Herod the Great. And he was, and then, Herod, and then she marries this Herod. 
And so it's like, um, that's wrong. It's not lawful. It is contrary to the law of God for thee to have thy brother's wife. In verse 19, therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a what? Just man and unholy and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So John the Baptist, it's clear, was all things that were unjust or unright, he would hit them head, to, head, head on. In fact, when he was preaching, um, when the, uh, by and be baptized, but he said, bring fruits of what? Repentance. Don't just say, okay, you know, I'm just coming. Re fruits of repentance. And what are fruits of repentance, by the way? Yeah, you're sorry for what you did. You turn away from the sin. That's justice. And here, as John was dealing with Herod the Great, he told him straight out. He did not hide it. He said, Herod, you are in sin and you're in need of mercy because that's what happens. When you find yourself in sin, God's not, okay, you're in sin. I'm just casting you aside. You're in need of mercy. Come to him for forgiveness and cleansing so that you can be saved. Isn't that, that's an opportunity of mercy. And so here we see that John the Baptist was someone who uh, gave that invitation of mercy because he was a just man. And we know the story. What happened to, to John the Baptist as a result of his witness of, uh, of justice? He was put in prison and eventually he was beheaded by Herodias. But that did not turn aside from the fact that, John, that he was still he was still a just man and he gave the truth and he continued to give the truth as long as his life lasted. He was a just man and all people that are just, they have to continue to declare the truth and give the truth because at the end, the God of justice at the end rewards all and he will be rewarded accordingly. You know what I mean by that? Eternal life. So that's why when God says no evil shall befall thee, even though what she did was evil, it was the end result of what was done was going to work out for good because God was going to turn it around. Because what is life here on this earth? It's just a, a brief grass. It's like grass that grows up and withers away. But in the end, it was going to turn out for good. If, as John was faithful to the end, he was just to the end he was going to receive the blessing that was promised. Now, why is this so important? You know, we hear a lot of injustice in the world today. I mean, a lot. You know, it's like the time of Noah. <laughs> I mean, the wickedness is great upon the world. And as we see the injustice in the world, the temptation is to, um, I don't know, become like one of them almost where you kind of like, well, you know, everybody else is doing this. I might as well join them kind of an attitude. But God says, no, 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 no. I am a rewarder of, for the just. That is his character, and it must be our character. And if we are to be saved, we have to exhibit God's character. Just like Noah did, was just, despite all of the injustice and wickedness in the world, we have to be just, and we have to continue to be just until the very end of time. We have to continue to endure till the end of time because God promises that he will reward those who um, exhibit his character of justice. Let's close out with um, the text here in Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15 as it talks about God's name, starting with verse one, because before the plagues are poured out, God uh, gives us this picture in Revelation chapter 15, and uh, let's read about it here. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having what? The seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. 
and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sand of the sea, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, Lord God almighty, just and because this is the same reference back in, in Deuteronomy that we started with in Deuteronomy chapter 32, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints, who shall not fear thou only art holy for all nations worship before thee for thy judgments are made, made. you know, um, and this is a pit plagues are are poured out because um, the plagues are poured out in Revelation in chapter 16 in the next chapter. God shows us a picture of those who have gotten the victory over the, over the beast. And how did they get the victory? Through the blood of the lamb. And as a result of getting the victory, they've come. They've, they were all guilty. They came to Christ. God cleansed them from sin. And because they repented, they returned from sin. And now they have God's character in their forehead. They're reflecting the image of God. And as a result, they too can stand up and they say, Lord, you've given people an opportunity to be saved. You've given the provision for them to have mercy. And all your judgments are manifest that you are just and true. Because if someone rejects the salvation that God has so graciously offered to us to be saved, whose fault is it? It's no one's fault but our own. Because God has made a provision for our salvation. He requires us to be just, but he didn't just require it. He made a way for us to be just. And that's through his son, Jesus Christ, working in us to both will and do his good pleasure. So let's remember God's character. Even though you see injustice in the world today, remember, that's not God's character. And um, not only is that not God's character, that can't be our character. We have to be just. And when we see injustice, we can stand up and say something against it. But at that point, it ends. In our, in, in our recognition of something that is unjust, we can't be unjust as well. We have to still be just like God and exhibit his character. Let's close out with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Um, as we continue to look at your character, Lord, we see the character of justice, that uh, you are a God of justice. You're a God of mercy. You're a God of justice. And you balance the two. And you have shown us through your word, Lord, that uh, you love us. And that's why you desire to save us. You are not a you are not. Uh, mean. You are doing everything you can to save people. And that's why you have given us this provision of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, may we recognize what you have done for us and give you glory for giving us this opportunity and submit to your divine authority over us and repent, turn away from sin so that we can be saved and are part of those who enter into the kingdom that you have promised for all who are righteous. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to have a special song before the sermon, um, and uh, it's entitled Preacher. Don't tell me what I want to hear. Tell me, uh, tell me the truth. <laughs> And that's what uh, all of God's people, his true uh, preachers, his true uh, prophets, they tell the truth. It may not be popular, just like John's message may not have been popular, but he spoke the truth in love. And uh, so that's what our song is for today. Preacher, tell me like it is. <laughs> Preacher, preacher, tell me like it is. Ready? Ready? Set, go. 
Preacher, I say it's been a while since you heard this request, but my spirit is tired and I need rest. I want to hear from heaven a clear word from God, a sermon of conviction straight from the heart. I've been hearing other preachers say I don't have to change. The most eloquent of speakers tells me I'm okay. But it hasn't eased my conscience, and I know it's not the truth. So when you stand before us, can I count on you? Oh, preacher, you say you want to be my friend. Don't be afraid to call my sin what it is. And preacher, tell me I can overcome. But it's only by the blood of the Lamb. Don't tell me like I wish it was. Preacher, tell me like it is. So open up the Word and let the Spirit lead. And preach until I've heard God speak to me. Don't worry about my feelings. Don't worry about my shame. Just preach the cross of Jesus and that I'm to blame. So preacher, you say you want to be my friend. Don't be afraid to call my sin what it is. And preacher, tell me I can overcome. But it's only by the blood of the Lamb. Don't tell me like I wish it was. Preacher, tell me like it is. Amen. Many people, like we saw in today's Sabbath school, they like to hear the falsehood from the false preachers. They like it so. Um, but we must... Um, but we must not, um, we must want to hear from what the Bible says and what the Bible reveals, not what we want and uh, to be, not what we want to be. I need a clicker as well. The clicker as well. Also back there. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all you've done for us. Uh, thank you for the Sabbath and blessing the Sabbath service uh, so far. And please bless the sermon. And please give us understanding as we study your word. And please teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So today's topic is, for the hour of his judgment has come. And that's a quote from Revelation 14, verse 7. But uh, many people think Revelation is hard to understand. But first of all, what does Revelation mean? We see Revelation 1, what does the Bible say? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show his servants the things which shortly must be done. He sent it and sent it by his angel into a servant, John. You know, so Revelation, the definition of do what? As we saw in the verse, and verse Revelation 1, verse 1, it said to show unto his servants the things which shortly must be done. So God gave this book to show us what shortly must be done. Um, and there's many prophecies here uh, in, the, uh, in Revelation for these last days that we must know. And a part of this is the urgent messages, the four urgent messages in Revelation 14 and Revelation 18. Today we're going to look at Revelation 14, specifically looking at the judgment. Fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. It's an urgent study. We must under understand it even more. Uh, now, so... Um, Let's look at this. The introduction to the first angel's message begins in Revelation 14, verse 6. Revelation 14, verse 6. What does it say here? It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Angel here, it, um, 
it means um, a messenger, um, by implication, a pastor. That's what it, an angel means. Uh, so we see people, his messengers, that go into the earth. The, these messengers were flying in the midst of hell, preaching to them that dwell on the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But we see they're flying in the midst of heaven. So why are they flying in the midst of heaven? What is the advantage of flying in the midst of heaven versus on the ground? More. It says in Thayer's definition, midst of heaven, it says the highest in the heaven, which is the sun um, and occupies at noon. It says what where what is done can be seen and heard by all. So that's, but that's the main point of it. Where what is done can be seen and heard by all. And so um, this message will be seen. You know, so that's, that's showing that these three angels' message will be seen and heard by all. As the verse says. Um, so now what is the message given by this angel flying in mist of heaven? What, what does he say? It says in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So we see the message here given is a very judgment is come. So according to Revelation 14, verse 7, we're living in a time of judgment. We are living in the hour of judgment. But also we see it here the, the messenger calls the earth to worship the only true God. This can't be um, a Buddha or Hindu, their God. It is the God that does what? That made the heaven, the earth, and the sea and fountains of water. So it doesn't just say worship God, because the Muslims say they worship God. The Hindus say they worship God. But it shows which God you worship. The God that made the heavens, the earth, and the sea and the fountains of water. It's the God of the Bible. That's who we're to worship. But uh, what does fear here mean? Also, fear. Um, fear. It means... Uh, in this case, to reverence, um, to be in awe of. That, that's what it's saying, to fear or reverence God, be in awe of God. So fear does not mean to be afraid or scared. It means that we are to have respect to God. And seeing God's perfect uh, loving character, it should, want us, it should make us want to serve him more. And um, so this is the message that Revelation hour of his judgment is coming. That's what we're going to focus on today. Has come. So now what judgment is this? What judgment is this? So let's go to Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14. What does the Bible say about this judgment? It says, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And um, so we see that there is a judgment when God will bring every secret thing, every good or evil thing. And let's go to also 2 Corinthians verse 5, chapter 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. The Bible reveals more about this judgment. Um, and it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done according to that which you have done, whether it be good or bad or bad. All right, so we see that. Um, Everything will um, go into judgment. And we see that we judge based on rank, money, or title. Every work will be in be good deeds or evil. So the good and evil both will be uh, in review before the searching eyes of God. All of our names. All right. So now to the Pharisees who falsely accuse Christ of blasphemy. Um, well, Jesus gave them a warning. And after they, when they said that, Jesus gave them a warning. Because what they said was really wicked and blasphemy against God. They say he was working. Jesus, who came to save us from the power of Satan, was working through the power of Satan. That's what the Jews accused him. But Jesus says, 
and gave a warning to them. It says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So we see a very important topic here is given, and Jesus points them to the judgment, where their words were to be judged. And uh, by their words they'd be justified or condemned. So this is a solemn thought that, uh, that we have here. Every thought will be reviewed. Every um, word spoken um, or deed done, good or evil. And it, will, it will go in review before the great judge. Um, so now we know that all their deeds are going to be reviewed and come back at us in the judgment. So now where are our deeds recorded at? Where are deeds recorded in the judgment? Well, let's look at Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, we read of the judgment. Daniel 7, we're going to look at verse 10. Daniel 7, verse 10. And uh, the Bible says here, where are deeds recorded? It says, a fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. And what? The judgment was set, and the books were opened. So there's some books related to the judgment that obviously our deeds are recorded in. Also, let's go to, let's go to um, Revelation 12. I mean, 2012, Revelation, all the dead, small and great stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book. Uh, so there's obviously more than one book, but the book we see what? The book of life, right? Um, so we see there's these books were open at first, the book of life first. Um, it's uh, the name shows what it is. It's a book of life. Those who are written in this book are clothed in white raiment. Uh, they are righteous and, and made righteous by Christ. That's, those are the people who are written in the book of life. Uh, the uh, overcomers. And what promise does Jesus give to the overcomers um, that have overcome about this book of life? What promise does he give to them about this book of life? Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Revelation 3, verse 5. Revelation 3, verse 5. And Jesus says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life. So God says, those that overcome, those that, over, that, those that are clothed in white raiment, uh, will be written in the book of life. And he says, I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So that's the promise God gives to those that overcome. What happened to those that are still stained with sin? Well, of course, we know that sin, that, um, sin will not be in heaven. God has made that very clear. And uh, over and over, God has said that in Revelation 21, verse 27, it says, there shall no wise enter into it anything that the fall of, Neither whatsoever work of abomination or maketh a lie. Sin nor spirit of rebellion will be in heaven. Because it's been demonstrated to all the earth, to all the universe, to every single one, what sin is. Is it liberty? Is it not peace? It is what? Death in the wall. That's, that's what sin is. So if you want to put another, another word for sin, to simplify it, let's just put death. That's what it is. It's uh, misery. Um, so that won't be in heaven. So what will happen to those, uh, what will happen with sin? How are their names be? Will their names be in the, that book of life? Or will it be erased? Let's, uh, let's go to 33. Exodus 33, verse 33. It says, and the Lord sent Moses, whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. And so we see that all those who continue in sin will not be found in the book of life. And God told Moses, who, whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of the, of the book. Um, so the Bible is clear. Those that sin, they will be blotted out of the book. And what will happen to those whose names are not written in the book of life? What's the Bible available about that? If their names are blotted out of the book of life, will they be in heaven? Revelation 15 20, what, Revelation 20, 15. Revelation 20, 15. 
And the Bible says here, it says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was what? Was cast into the lake of fire. Um, so those that are not written in the book of life, those whose names have been blotted out because of sin, will um, not be in the book of life. And the Bible made that abundantly clear. So it's, what book do you want to be in? <laughs> the book of life. The book of life. Uh, we want all our names to be written in the book of life. It says right here, um, in the Great Controversy, page um, 480, paragraph two, uh, uh, 3. Thank you. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. It says, the book of life contains the names of all who have ever entered the service of God. Jesus bade his disciples rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And the book of life. That's what he says in Philippians 4, verse 3. Daniel looking, and the revelator says that only those shall enter in, into the city of God whose names are what? Written in the book. So, um, life contains the, the names of the saved. That's who's all the saved. But now there's another book. So we see there's books were open, right? It wasn't only one, but it was books. So now there's another book. It is called the Book of Remembrance, in which the deeds of the righteous are recorded. And so let's go to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. We're looking at verse um, 16. And it says here, it says, And they that fear the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written befo before him, before them, for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. So we see there is a book of remembrance. And, um, and here is recorded... Um, you know, their victory is over sin. There's a trial and all original the deeds of the righteous. That's recorded. God takes note of that. God takes uh, note of that um, when it's done. And it's recorded in the book. <laughs> but uh, we see um, if a person turns away from the right path, what will happen to those things remembered in the book? Let's go to Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18, verse 24. Ezekiel 18, verse 24. The Bible reveals what will happen to those who turn away from the right path. Ezekiel 18, verse 24. Um, it says, But when the righteous turn away from, the, from his righteousness and commit of iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that a wicked man doeth, um, shall he live? He was, you know, at church. He got baptized. But now, in 2020, he is at the bar. <laughs> so now, because of his baptism in 1985, is he saved still? You know, that's what some people believe. They're saved and never change. Well, let's, let's continue. Shall he live? So he's doing wickedness. It says, shall he live? It says, all his righteousness that he have committed shall not be mentioned. And his trespass, he have trespassed and and his sin that he has sinned in them shall he die. So we see that he would not be remembered. Um, in his sin, I, because he is, you know, he went back. He didn't be righteously, but he went back in sin. So in his sin, he's gonna die. Not once saved, always saved. So that kind of puts that down right there. <laughs> but it says right here, this book, a book of remembrance is written before are the recorded the good deeds of them that fear the Lord and that thought upon his name. Their words of God. In the book of God, in the book of God's remembrance, every deal of righteousness is immortalized. Every temptation, every word of tender pity expressed is faithful sacrifice. Every suffering and sorrow endured for Christ. Tell us my wanderings. Thou put my tears into thy bother. Are they not? Psalms 56, verse 8, and that's great controversy. See that um, 
all these things are of remembrance, as we have said. So that's a good book to be a part of. And all those that are in the book of life are in the book of remembrance. But now there's another book. And this book is the record of sin. The book of the record of sin. And this is a book that we do not want our names to be written in. Um, every act, open or secret, along with every evil thought, just as faithfully as, re- as it was recorded in the book of remembrance, the evil. Le- Let's go to Re- Romans 14, 12. Romans 14, verse 11 and 12. Romans 13, or Romans 14. What does the Bible say about the judgment? It says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow unto me, and every tongue shall confess unto God. And uh, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So everyone will give an account of himself to God. Um, and we see it's recorded right in here in this book. But uh, let's also go to um, Matthew 12, verse 37. We looked at it earlier. But here, we looked at this earlier, but we're going to look at it again. Matthew 12, 37. Matthew 12, 37. And Jesus says here, For by thy words, well, I'll read the verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So all this is, all all our words are justifying us or condemning us. Ecclesiastes 9, Ecclesiastes 11, 9. Let's go there. Ecclesiastes 11, 9. All right. Ecclesiastes 11, 9. It says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. Let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. Walk in the ways of thine heart, in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. So all the acts we've done are going to be brought into judgment. And that's what here Solomon is reminding us of. All these things are, brought, are going to be brought to us in the judgment. All right, so... Yeah, we know all of us have sinned, but um, every but we must sin, and if we forsake and leave sin, our, our we won't be in that book <laughs> of, of a record of sin. So, but every sin not confessed and for Satan for, forsaken is written in this book. It says for here, every man's work passes in review before God and is registered for faithfulness or unfaithfulness. Um, opposite each name in the book of heaven is entered with. Terrible exactness, every wrong word for its sin, with every artful dissembling, heaven sent warnings or reproof. Angel, that is serious. All our acts is we have good news. Twenty-eight, Proverbs twenty, verse thirteen. It says, "He that can cover his sin." It say, hey, it's not really a big deal. You know, I put that under the and shall not prosper. But whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have that we may overcome that and we can have our names written in the book of life. So that's the hope. And um, we just read, remember we read in Ezekiel 18 that those that uh, are righteous and sin, their names are taken out of the book of life, but we go back. Let's go back to Ezekiel 18. We're going to read that those that are wicked and turn to righteousness are uh, remembered. <laughs> um, Ezekiel 18, verse 21 and uh, 22. And it says, but if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and will keep all my statues and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live and he shall not die. All his transgressions they have committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he have done, he shall live. And so we see that he will live if he has uh, turned from the sin and um, repented. Um, all his sin are, is not going to be rem- remembered. It's going to be erased out of the book of the record of sin. But it says right here, though, the warning is that sins that have not been repented of or forsaken will not be pardoned and blotted out of the book's record, but will stand to witness against the sinner in the day of God. He may have committed his evil deeds in the light of day or in, or in the darkness of the night, but they 
before him with whom we have to do. The angels of God witness each other. No one, but guilty actors may cherish the least suspicion of wrong. But it is said for the intelligence of heaven. So no, no matter how secret, knowledge of the eternal. God has an exact record fair, unfair dealing. He is not by appearances of piety, though it might deceive others. <laughs> Mistake uh, in his estimation of character. Men may be deceived by those. How solemn the thought, day after um, Oh, I had, all right, great, great, great. How solemn thought, great. <laughs> How solemn the thought, day after the day after registered both the good and the evil. The mighty is the record of a single day or acts or words, even our most secret of most uh, well or woe. And though they may be forgotten. So all these things will stand to justify or condemn uh, us. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so we know all judgment has a standard, right? All judgment, all judgment has a standard, and there's, and there's laws for our nation to set the standard for judgment. So you went over 15 miles over the speed limit, over 75. You ought to go to jail. <laughs> really? What? Yeah, so that's what the law says. So, um, then um, if you're feeling guilty, the law comes at you, right? So there's always, for judgment, there's always a law that we're judged by. And so what is the judgment of, for, what is the standard for this judgment that we have? What is the standard of the judgment? Well, let's go to James chapter 2, verse 12. James 2, 12. James 2, verse 12. The Bible makes it really clear to so speaking and so do that said they should be judged by the law of liberty. So we're judged by the law of liberty, the Ten Commandments. That's the standard of judgment. Our life will be compared to the standard. And if we want to stand the judgment, we must be uh, fit the standard of judgment. So that's who we compare our lives to, not to anyone else, but to the law, to God's standard. Um. So we see that, um, again, going back to Revelation 14, verse 7, the hour of his judgment has come. So now, when did this judgment begin? Because it says the hour of his judgment, judgment has come. So when did it begin? When did this judgment begin? All right, so let's go to Daniel eight fourteen. I have it on the screen right here. It says, and he said to me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So to how much? Unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary wants to be cleansed. And once a year, remember, once a year on the Day of Atonement, the heavenly sanctuary, heavenly services, and all that was, you know, pattern, foreshadowing the Christ, foreshadowing his ministry, and in heaven for us here. Um, we, won't go to, we won't go into this much today, but um, we're going to look at some. Uh, so according to the interp to interpretation, because uh, we see that um, uh, the, uh, we see the 2300 days prophecy into 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The cleansing of the sanctuary and the judgment go hand in hand. When the um, the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary represents the time of judgment when the heavenly uh, sanctuary is cleansed from the records of sin. The professed people of God will be investigated to see if they had turned from away from sin or sin. It's going to be cleansed from sin, but and they keep it, they would not be cleansed. So, uh, but those that have turned away from sin, uh, the Bible reveals that their record will be wiped away. So the cleansing of the sanctuary and the judgment are the same thing. So now if we can find the start date, because we see after 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed as a timeline. So if we can find the start date for that timeline, we can find out um, when the judgment begins. Are you got that? 
so we could find out when the judgment begins if we find the start date of the cleansing of the sanctuary, the 2300 days. Now, let's, let's see what the Bible says that. So according to the interpretation given Daniel, uh, in Daniel chapter 9, um, when did this timeline begin? 457. What happened then? Let's go to um, uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. It says, No, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build the Jerusalem and to the Messiah, the prince shall be what? Seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. The street should be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. The, uh, the uh, command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The restoring of Jerusalem to their uh and um so at the this decree uh so what decree would start this uh the decree to the commandment to restore and to build jerusalem let's look at that when did that happen what decree gave uh israel or judah is um government to restore what decree was done that did that let's go uh to daniel i mean let's go to ezra Ezra, Ezra, chapter 7, we're looking at verse 12 and 13. We read of, the, of, of a decree given by Artaxerxes in 457. And this is a decree that, we, that you mentioned <laughs> earlier. The decree you mentioned. <laughs> yeah, the 457. It says here in Ezra chapter 7, Ezra 7, we're going to look at verse 12 through 13. And the Bible says, um, Artaxerxes, the king of kings, the Ezra, the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, perfect peace at such a time. I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. Now we're going to look at 5 through 27. It says, Send magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people, that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. And the law of the king, let judgment be executed into death, or into banishment, or into confiscation of goods, or to imprisonment. Blessed be the Lord. So this is the exact fulfillment of that command, to restore um, so now, of the 2300 day prophecy, we can find out when the cleansing of the sanctuary will begin or when the judgment will begin. All right. So let's count and see if we count, if we count that 2300 uh, years, because remember, day for year principle in Bible prophecy. We a little, um, a little uh, chart of that, because um, we saw in Daniel, in Daniel um, 7, verse 25. 9 25 we saw the 69 weeks and uh, if you read there we have the 70 weeks and 69 weeks and um, all these things this, this timeline prophecy was built and designed to um give us all these confirmation dates you know so we, we're not lost you know and when um the um four um 483 years first the 69 weeks that goes and it was to go to when the messiah the prince and we see the Jesus was baptized, and there was a seventy weeks of, of, above that, and uh, in the midst of the week, as we see in, be, in between uh, uh, four eighty three and four ninety, was seven years, and the Bible says in the midst of the week Christ was to be crucified, and we know that Jesus ministered for how long? Three and a half years. Christ was crucified exactly in the midst of the week. So this is all confirming that 457 is right, because if it was not 457, then Mr. Week won't be the right place. Um, so uh, Mr. Week, Christ crucified. Three and a half years later, the, um, the first Christian martyr was killed by the Jews. They stole Stephen. Three and a half years later after Christ was crucified, and um, that ended the 70 weeks. You know, so that exactly fitted in with the prophecy first given with four, uh, or beginning with 457. Then after that, we have 18, 800, 1810 years. We have uh, 1,810 years after the uh, 
34 AD when Stephen was sown. And that brings us to when? 1844. When the judgment, the investigative judgment begins. So now, 1844 was how long ago from now? Yeah, so we see that um, we've been in the time of judgment for a, 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 a long time now. <laughs> um, ever since that time, we've been in judgment. Um, 2300 days in 1844 began the work of investigation. The name of Christ must pass its searching scrutiny, both the living and their work. So we see that at the close of 2300 days uh, began the work of investigation. The, investigative judgment it begins with who the the righteous the, the dead and then it will pass to the living and that time we don't we don't exactly know when that happens when it passes from the dead to living but who will be judged everyone from adam all the way to now um all those who professed um the name of the lord will uh be investigated to see if they have forsaken their sins but um we know that Satan is really trying to divert the minds of the people away from this truth. Um, he has created many distractions to keep the minds occupied, um, as we see now. It says, Satan invests a number of schemes to occupy our mind, that we may not dwell upon the very work with which we ought to be best accounted. The arch deceiver hates the great truths that bring to view the, an atoning sacrifice and an all-powerful mediator. And uh, he knows that with him, everything depends on diverting the minds from Jesus and his truth. So what will happen if Satan can divert the minds from Jesus and his truth? What will happen for, to them in the judgment? We know that they won't, they, won't, they won't be reading the word. If they don't read the word, they won't know about the judgment. You know, about what God says, every thought, every word, every action is going to be judged. So they pass on carelessly uh, through this time when God is saying there's a solemn now. We're living in a time of judgment and uh, we must fit our lives to fit, permit <laughs> nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness and the fear of God. Um. The precious hours, instead of being given to pleasure, to display, or to gain-seeking, gain should be devoted to an earnest, prayerful, prayerful study of the word, fully understood by the people of God. As well as all the, it says, all need a knowledge for themselves. Um, know that Jesus is a great high priest. And when did he go to the heavenly sanctuary? And where did he first go when he ministered, when he began his ministry in heaven as our great high priest? The holy place. And when did he begin the holy place ministration? When he went to heaven after, after 30, um, 31 AD. After 31 AD. He began the work in the holy place of the sanctuary. The heavenly sanctuary. And... Um, we see he, he cut Seder all the time, and the time of judgment began at the end of the 2300 days. And so this, you know, the, the work of the great high priest, we must, you know, know and come to be familiar with. It says, otherwise it will be impossible for them to exercise a faith which is true at this time to occupy the position which God designs, position which God designs them to fulfill. Every individual. And it says, each has a case pending at each must meet the great judge face to face. How important then that every mind contemplate the often, often the seldom seen when the judgment shall sit and the book shall be opened with Daniel. Every individual must stand in his lot at the end of days. So, before God, when our case is revealed, and when our lives are put in scrutiny, remember, let's go back there. Um, let's go back there. Uh, uh, in Matthew, Matthew um, 12, 6 and 37. 
Matthew 12, 36 and 37. What I got to say here again, it says, But I say unto you that every idle word which men shall speak, and they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So uh, knowing that, um, knowing that we are living in the solemn time, we see now in the judgment our words are um, are taken. And by thy words, because our words are not just, we don't just speak words, because um, the Bible just says, for by thy words thou shalt be justified and condemned. So we can't just speak anything. Um, uh, we got to speak that which is righteous, because by our words, by our actions, by our thoughts, all our thoughts, actions, words are being reviewed by God. And when that happens, uh, so knowing that we're in the time of judgment is a very solemn thought. And we must make sure that every sin has been covered by the blood and blotted out of the book. And by faith, written in the book of life. Well, uh, what will happen to, our, will happen to us? Well, we know that at the second of coming of Christ, our bodies will be changed, right? But there's one thing that does not change. And let's, but look at us first. Um, we're going to look at um, 1 Thessalonians, verse 13. And um, is this one where it says about the uh, change? Um, anyway, no, it's not that one. It's, it's Corinthians uh, 15, right? Help me out here. I'm out with a sermon, so <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Philippians 4, yeah. Philippians 4, uh, we're changed, right? So I wouldn't just leave you, like, hanging, because uh, I have, I have uh, yeah. But uh, Philippians 4, what was it? Philippians 4, uh, the one where we are uh, changed. I think it's uh, maybe 15. Yeah, it's all 15, right? Yeah. But um, so we see there's a resurrection, that uh, Paul preaches of, and at this time, uh, there's many people saying that there is no resurrection. No resurrection. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, so Paul preaches of the resurrection. There's a dangerous heresy of no resurrection. And this corresponds with this, the, the, the doctrine of spiritualism that is going out, you know, very rapidly and widely, that, um, that the dead go straight to heaven. But now with that, they're basically saying if the dead are already in heaven, why is there a resurrection? Why is there resurrection? Um, so when they so that un, that doctrine begins to undermine the plain written statements of the resurrection, and there's people in the Paul's day that were undermining that doctrine of the resurrection, and so so um, he gives them a warning, you know, saying that if Christ be not risen from the dead, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then we have no hope. Um, and also, it's funny that many people they 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 believe that the dead go straight to heaven, but then they they then they go to Easter sunrise that Christ resurrected from the grave <laughs> when um he should have already been in heaven. Why do he have to resurrect from the grave? <laughs> so they contradict themselves and the and their and the doctrines of Babylon. That's how we know it's the doctrine of Babylon. But he, Philippians three twenty and twenty one. All right, uh, we go there, but we first we're gonna look at um, Corinthians, First Corinthians, verse um, fifteen. It says, "And now this I say, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the, the kingdom of God." That's verse fifteen. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So the corrupt, as we just saw earlier today, the will not inherit the uncorrupt. It says, Behold, I show you the mystery that we should not all sleep, but we should all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. Um, so when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that saying that it's written, death is swallowed into victory. Oh, death, where is a sting? Oh, grave, where is a victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that we are to be changed, right? But there's one thing that, we, that does not change. 
and that is character. Our characters will not change um, in heaven. It's not, you know, it's not going to be like we're, we're sinning on earth. We love sin. But in heaven, we're going to be changed. Like our mindset's just going to, you know, kind of change around and we uh, think differently. Like, so before on earth, I, I wanted to get the drink, alcohol, and, you know, sin and break Ten Commandments, you know, going through um, all of them. You know, whole list. <laughs> um, do the things that are exactly are spoken in against in First uh, Corinthians chapter six. But in heaven, uh, I go to heaven, and um, there's some change that happens in my thinking where I no longer like that. Well, the Bible does not reveal that. The Bible reveals that that must be taken care of when, now, now that must be changed now. Because imagine that in heaven, they want, they want, um, they want to enjoy heaven. Loving the alcohol, because alcohol is not going to be there. It's not going to be made there. And so the person loving that, <laughs> they're going to be really frustrated in heaven. Really frustrated, upset, mad. They're not going to like it. Um, so our characters must be in line with the Bible, because um, our characters are not going to change at the second coming of Christ. Um, but we can have our character change at the uh, now by the power of Christ. That was the text you said earlier. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. All right, so our conversation is heaven from whence we look for the Savior Jesus Christ, who shall change our vow body, body that it may be fashioned and like unto his glory, even to subdue all things unto himself. So, yeah, I really like that one. Um, we see that... Um, the Savior, he shall change Amen. from mortal to immortality, from corruption to incorruption. So that's all going to be completely changed. But um, our characters, like I said and repeated over and over again, is going to remain the same. Amen. Amen. He gave us the ability to choose. Um, we're not made like robots and program to do righteously or unrighteously. So he can't force us and God does not force us. Um, but he gives, yeah, he gives us a conscious choice to choose life <laughs> or death, you know? So for those that refuse to choose life, the, the, the ultimate result is, death but in that god is just and he has mercy in his dealings and i can spew they're talking about justice now but god is just and um in all his dealings um and all the things that are going on, on the earth um it's you know it's clear that man is not just they're greedy and um even with all their vaccine stuff and the COVID 19 they're greedy you know they're they're getting billions and who does it go to the um the their people the works of the earth babylon and so you know we see the greedy and just but god is just and um in his judgment that he will have any more questions or comments any question or comments that you have they have um basically in regard to anything <laughs> any question because i will you know anything you know any i mean just say it out now you know <laughs> anything yeah That's what we judge God. Amen. And God is fair. He gave us the, the, the law of liberty. Mm -hmm. We judge God. And it's, if we lost the same, it's not right. It's Amen. Not everything to save us. Okay, it's done everything to save us. And um, it's our choice to show. Yeah, so he reveals that we're in the judgment. So now God reveals that we're in the judgment to sh that we may be ready. You know, he's not judging us unknowingly. He says, you're in the time of judgment. Your cases are being revealed. Your life is going before the judge. 
every word, every thought, every action is has been written down. In what book? The book of life for the saved. The book of remembrance for the saved. And the book of the record of sin for those who continue to hold on to sin. And as God is revealing that all that has been recorded down. Your whole life is in one book. It's in one of those books. It's either in the book of life, in the book of remembrance, or in the record of sin. It's, in, it's written down in heaven. Every word, every act, everything has been written down. And God, God is letting us know that we may be ready. And um, he does not let us know the judgment, the coming judgment to scare us. But he lets us know that we may um, find the, um, the, the pardon and that our sins may be removed. And um, blotted out out of the book of uh, the record of sin. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm doing Sabbath school. Any more questions or comments? <laughs> Any more questions? Let's, we're, we're, uh, let's, it's, it's 1130, let's say. <laughs> and we're taking question or comments. Um, any question or comments? <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's why he gives a loud cry. Um, and that's why that message was so urgent, as we saw in Revelation uh, 14, verse uh, 6. That's why it was so urgent, so loud, and powerful, flying in the heaven to warn the earth. Um, it's not a, he said, he didn't say it in a low tone, but he wants this message to go to all the earth in a loud manner. And it has, it has gone. Uh, this message of the judgment has gone to the earth. And it will continue to go to the earth. But also we have some other messages that we must give, which is the first, because it doesn't stop at the first angel's message only. <laughs> it, be, it continues with the um, second, third, and then the fourth one uh, in uh, Revelation 18 that uh, gives a call to come out of Babylon um, to all the earth. Any more questions, comments? Don't be stubborn like Judah. That's what you talked about this morning, um, the stubbornness of Judah. And so don't be stubborn like Judah when God is continually giving the warnings. And so, um, like we saw there, they had a choice to make uh, between life or death. And God gave them the choice, destruction or, um, or life. <laughs> and how was Israel? They were stubborn, rebellious. And we, we, we saw that in... Um, Jeremiah, as we say, I mean, Isaiah, as we're saying Jeremiah, we also see that. And as she talked about today, the stubbornness of Judah and how they refused to rebel. And instead of listening to the, what the word of God said, who did they listen to? Yeah, yeah, they killed the false, they killed the true prophets. And who did they listen to? And what, and what they, yeah, they listened to false prophets. And what were the false prophets telling them? The things, <laughs> the things they wanted to hear, right? We saw that, right? And it said they liked it so. They, they, they were telling them falsehoods, but the people, they liked it so. I, I wonder why they liked it so. I mean, we, can, we, can, we can compare the, the messages of the, false, of the true prophets versus the false prophets and, and find why they did not like, uh, why they liked the false prophets over the true prophets. And the true prophets, they, they, their message was repent, judgment coming. It was either repent, have life, or um, don't repent, and justice is coming. Judgment is coming. That was, their, that was their whole message. That's what John the Baptist preached. Amen. Not what you talked about in your story. But, um, um, and, and, and Jeremiah said that it hurt him to his heart. It hurt him to his heart, the, the, the condition of Israel. But we see the, the, the message that people want to hear. They didn't want to hear that message. They want to hear a smooth message. And that's what the false prophets were preaching. Uh, they said peace when the people were in sin. And the Bible said, God warned them in, in Deuteronomy that they will have no peace if they, if they uh, rebel when a God has um, given them uh, many blessings and they rebel. God revealed it Moses through Moses um, in Deuteronomy that they will have no peace. But the prophets said, you're going to have peace. So that was a direct contradiction of what the Bible said. And um, so that's what, the, that, that's what the people wanted to hear. They wanted to hear that message. And a, a, a good example of that 
is when um has um um Ahab and um Ahab and um that's right there, Joe, not Joab. <laughs> Ahab, Jehoshaphat. Ahab and Jehoshaphat were sitting down, and the 400 prophets, the false prophets, came. They prophesied, and they prophesied what he wanted to hear. If he said uh, whatever he wanted, they prophesied. And he, he, he wanted to go to battle with Syria. They said he will be prosperous in his fight. He will win, and um, they gave um, you know illustration. But Jehoshaphat worshipped God, and he was not really satisfied with the answer of the false prophets. And he asked for a true prophet of God, and it was one against four hundred people. One against four hundred. Four hundred agreed to lie, <laughs> and God said that He had put a lying spirit in their mouths. But um, so they prophesied exactly what King Ahab wanted. But uh, God gave the message through um, uh, His prophet. Uh, it was. Um, Micaiah, um, he gave the message that you're not going to be prosperous. <laughs> and uh, you actually said you're going to die there. And if you go, don't go. But uh, <laughs> as Ahab didn't like that message. But it was the truth. You know, he, he just told the plain truth. I mean, the, the other people, they're scared to tell the truth. You know, they will, you know, might lose their, you know, they'll be thrown in jail like, like Micaiah was done. <laughs> And they didn't want that to happen to them. So um, they decided to say, what, 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 what do you want to hear? You know, what, what does the king want to hear? And um, you want peace, prosperity? And that's what they always give. They always let you know you're going to have peace, prosperity, and all that to, um, to be like them. <laughs> and uh, that's what they told Ahab. But in reality, what happened? He died. <laughs> so it was shown that... Uh, the, the one prophet, though small as he was compared to the 400, though put in jail because of his straight message, uh, he is true. <laughs> and uh, because he, he said that what God told him, that's all he was going to say, not, not what the people were saying. He said, well, only what God tells me, that's what I'm going to say. And um, he gave the message, and um, it was evident and revealed that the Lord had spoken through him. Um, any more questions or comments? And so this message of the judgment, um, we must give that message. Any more questions or comments? And we'll end out with prayer if you do not. All right. So let's end out this uh, with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for uh, giving us understanding as we studied your word. And um. Uh, that you reveal to us that we're living in the time of judgment. The hour of judgment has begun. And please help our lives to be in line with the Bible standard of the Ten Commandments that we may um, stand through the judgment. May our, may our lives not be still stained with sin, but may they be uh, confessed and repentant of that um, it would no longer be on the books of the record of sin but our names in the book of life. And um, please bless the rest uh, of the Sabbath. And Jesus' name, amen. What? Hymn 119, the judgment is set. Hymn 119, the judgment is set. Yeah, come on. Yeah, come on. Judgment is set. Hymn 119. So I'll stand up and sing this. <laughs> Sorry. Him 119 in the red books. There we are. How shall we stand in that great day? It's over. Okay. <laughs> 
this song is really like an appeal song that goes with the message today because the question at the end of the of the series or at the end of it is how will how will we stand how will it be for us individually personally how shall we stand in that great day hymn 119 the judgment has set the judgment has set those books have been opened how shall we stand in that great day with every thought and word and action God the righteous Away. How shall we stand in that great day? How shall we stand in that great day? Shall we be found before him wanting? Or will our sins go washed away? The work is begun with those who are sleeping. Soon will the living air be dried. Out of the books of God's His decision to abide. How shall we stand in that great day? How shall we stand in that great day? Shall we be found before? Or with our sins all washed away. Oh, how shall we stand that moment of searching when all our sins those books reveal? When from that point we chase. Decided shall be granted no appeal. How shall we stand in that great day? How shall we stand in that great We'll close out with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we stand. It is our prayer that through the power of Jesus Christ working in us and through us, that we will make a decision, a choice to repent, turn from our sins, turn to you, and be saved. We pray, Lord, for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us. Again, today is a day to remember the, the time when your Holy Spirit was poured out upon your disciples in the upper room as they reflected upon the work and the mission that you had given to them and have given to each of us, which is to fear God, give glory to you, and to share the everlasting gospel, the invitation of mercy, the invitation of salvation. Help us, Lord, to be saved and help us, Lord, to be used by you 
to give the message so that others will make the decision to be saved also. Be with us this week and bless us, Lord. Help us and continue to strengthen us and to use us for your glory. We pray that you bless the tithe and offering that is received and may you be glorified in all the work that is done for you. In Jesus' name, amen.